Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Kabbalah for Everyone. As promised, today we are going to begin our deep dive into the godly soul. Now, the way that we talk about the godly soul, we call it the second soul. Now, let's take a look at the game of chess for a second. You can't play chess unless you know how all the pieces are allowed to move, their roles, their advantages, and their weaknesses. And only then can you actually start to play the game of chess. The same applies when you're working with your soul. In the previous classes, we spoke about this battle, this constant battle between the animal soul and the godly soul. There's this battle going on inside of us. Actually, Kabbalah calls the us, the small city. And so the godly soul and the animal soul are battling over the small city. And since the goal here is to learn how to win the battle, we first have to learn about all the attributes, all the capabilities, and the natures of these two souls in order to really understand how to, so to speak, play the game. So, as we said in our last episode, we're going to start with the godly soul because, remember, it's about increasing light and not battling the darkness. So the godly soul is an actual piece of God. It's a piece of the creator of the universe. So a, how would I say it? A, a, a sliver of holiness, like, like an apple that's cut into separate pieces. Just as every aspect Every characteristic of the apple can be found in each individual slice of the apple. So is every character trait and nature of God present in the godly soul. So it's not like you have a, a piece of God. What is a piece of God? When you have a, a piece of God, you have all of God because you can't have a piece of God. So I don't know if even the apple is a great example, but let's use the apple for now because it's the best example that I can think of offhand. And this idea that the characteristics, the makeup of the apple will be found in that slice of the apple. Maybe it won't be the whole apple, but it'll be all the characteristics. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about all the characteristics of God are found in this piece of God, and this piece of God is found within us. We call it the godly soul. Now, this is really hard to visualize, and it's even harder to put into practice. So let's make it easier by taking a look at some of the analogies from the teachings of Kabbalah. Before we start, we have to keep something in mind. All of the examples that we're going to share, they have a common idea. The world is comprised of three categories, creator, creation, and the intermediary between them, which we're going to call the godly soul. So in other words, the godly soul was not created like the rest of creation. It's a part of the creator that is sent down into this physical world and it's hidden in the physical body. So we'll start like this. In the beginning, in the greatest book that was ever written, otherwise known as the Torah, in Genesis and Bereshit, right in the beginning, where the Torah discusses the way the world was created, we read simply, God said, let there be light. This means that the world was created through the medium of speech. Think about it. God said, let there be light. So often we focus on the let there be light, and we will at some point, but God said, let there be light. It's godly speech. God spoke 
and the world came into being. So it was God's, again, you know, and we, we've spoken about this before, but I'll just reiterate it, that whenever we talk about a, a, a metaphor with regards to God, does God speak? Yes, but if we said God has a kajumaba, well, you'd say, what was that, Rabbi? So we, I say, or we say, we use these metaphors of God's speech because that's how we understand whatever that spiritual mechanism that makes up speech, whatever it's called, to us, we're going to call it speech. So we're saying that God spoke, the Torah is referring to the word speech, that God spoke and the world came into being. Now, when the Torah later describes the creation of man, the creation of Adam, and the formation of Adam's soul, it uses a very different language. It doesn't, says God, it doesn't say God said. It says God breathed. The word is vayipach, V-A-Y-I-P-A-C-H, vayipach, that God breathed into Adam a living soul, or the verse properly says, God breathed a living soul into him. What is that living soul? What is that related to? The word vayipach is related to the word nefuach, N-I-F-U-A-C-H, nefuach. Nefuach is to blow or to breathe out. And this illustrates that the soul is not spoken into existence, again, in the metaphor, that God, the soul is not spoken into existence like everything else in creation, but it is forcefully breathed into existence. Look at that difference, the difference between speaking and breathing, breathing, almost like from the depths. Now, what is the difference between speaking and breathing? Think about your own personal experience. I would use the example of a balloon. If you ever try blowing up a balloon, there's two things happen when you blow up a balloon. And it's difficult to do anything else at the same time that you blow a balloon and you tire quickly. Why? Because while you're blowing up the balloon, your breathing comes from deep within and draws on many of your internal faculties. When you speak, for example, I'm speaking right now, when you speak, it comes from a, an external source. And therefore, it's relatively easy to speak. We usually don't tire quickly from conversations with people, at least I don't. And maybe some people want me to tire quickly when I go on long-winded sermons. But generally, I don't, and I can definitely very easily speak to you and teach for many hours at a time. I don't know how many balloons I can blow up in the same amount of time that I gave this particular talk. I don't know when I would tire by blowing up balloons. Definitely, it would be much quicker than I would by talking to you. So the same thing with our soul. Our soul is coming from that, that blow. He blew into Adam a breath of life. Think about it. So like the balloon, the, the soul is coming from the innermost dimension of God, whereas the rest of creation is coming from a more, more external. So the example of speaking, which is a little more external, first the example of blowing up the balloon, which is much more internal, and it takes comes from the depths of the being. Now, another way, to appreciate the uniqueness of the divine soul's creation is by examining the difference between thought and speech. So we just spoke about the difference between, let's say, one element of speech and another element, like blowing versus speaking. Now let's think about thought versus speech. Speech is only an external expression of ourselves. It's not who we really are. I can say one thing and I can think something else, or I can say one thing and I can do something else. Our thought, on the other hand, our thought is 
much more unified with our soul. And our thought reveals our soul's essence. And this difference also explains, I would say, why we can stop speaking whenever we want, but our thought process is constant. We can never stop thinking. It's constantly flowing. And we can't even stop it for a moment. So I think that if you take a look at this as an analogy, it's going to further demonstrate why the divine soul is closer to God than any of his other creations, because it was created differently. And since it comes from this level of divine thought, not speech, so we see that the soul comes from divine thought and not speech, then we can see how the godly soul within us is a very different type of creation than the other creations. The next time uh, we meet, I'm going to start talking about the external versus the internal will. But for now, I'll leave you with these thoughts. I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts and your comments. And I'd love to hear what you're thinking and where this process is taking you. But for now, I'm Rabbi Yisrael Bernath. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for spending this time with me. And I hope to see you soon, very soon. Have a great day.